So without further ado, I'm very honored to introduce um, a researcher whose work I have admired for some time now. Dr. Emily Koch joins us from Cardiff University, where she is a lecturer in early modern history, working at the intersection of social and cultural histories of medicine and disability, with a particular focus on the face as a charged site of discourse. Her book, published by Manchester Press in 2019, is titled Rhinoplasty and the Nose in Early Modern British Medicine and Culture, a volume addressing early histories of plastic surgery in a manner with much to offer scholars of both art and the body. Her substantial list of published articles addresses such compelling topics as sexuality, shame, legal, the legal status of facial scars, gender, sex work, and concepts of monstrosity. Her lecture tonight is titled The Face and Technologies of Empire. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Koch. Thank you, Jess. So, uh, so thank you uh, and to the Warburg and welcome for hosting this series on pre-modern disability and for inviting me. Uh, I also thank you all for joining at the end of a very long semester uh, or if you're catching up on YouTube, I hope you are rested and perhaps cooking something that makes you happy. Uh, I am a white woman with short brown hair, a white shirt, a Douglas tartan tie, navy blazer and with bookshelves behind me. My pronouns are she, her. We have the benefit of relaxing in our own spaces, stretching, etc., fiddling if, you, if we need, so please do make yourself comfortable. I have put an access copy of the talk in the chat. So this talk comes out of my Lieberhume Trust research into facial difference in Britain's four nations, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, Virginia, Massachusetts, and New South Wales, Australia. I'm adopting a cultural approach to disability to ask whether and which differences in facial form or function could be disabling in these regions. How did they affect different types of people? Could the same physical marks, impairments, or injuries be differently disabling, carrying different effects of subjectivity, community and relationship formation, economic and legal stability, etc., in different times and places. Today, I am focusing on three white British men whose stories overlapped in the London newspapers of the early 1730s. Robert Jenkins found himself a catalyst for war with Spain after his ear was cut off by Spanish crew in the West Indies. Thomas Hayes and Jaffet Crook had their ears publicly cut off at Charing Cross Pillory in two of the last examples of such punishment within England. Juxtaposing these men's experiences provides a keen insight into the vulnerability and meanings of the face at this point in the British Imperial project. Their stories illustrate the power of the state to both employ and offer to protect subjects from disabling facial injuries as means of establishing authority. English law had marked the face in many ways, drawing on surgeons and hangmen's technical skills to ensure proportionality and preservation of life and control of print to steer the public narrative. While legal disfigurement ceased in England and became increasingly exoticized, it continued in other parts of the empire, causing discrepancies in the rights of individuals and in the lived experiences of people with judicial or merely visually similar facial differences in different regions. After all, in Leonard Davis's words, the body is never a single physical thing, so much as a series of attitudes towards it. Ultimately, I am trying to reassess familiar legal and medical documents through disability history to understand the experiences of people with facial difference of whatever cause. The conflicting meanings and attitudes toward the face and its accidental or punitive injuries, the extent to which the visible differences resulting from these injuries affected the individual's ability to thrive in their communities, and the systems and ideologies set up to negotiate these are my key areas of concern. Now, an apology that this paper is far more work in progress than I had anticipated, especially for lack of library and archive access for the very obvious reason. Uh, there are several to be continued, 
So I will therefore look forward to your suggestions for areas for development as I head into the summer. So how did the face matter in early modern Britain? And to what extent might marking the face be said to disable that person? The variably disabling effects of facial difference are being explored in a wide range of historical and contemporary contexts. And I have especially learned from the work of Patricia Skinner, David M. Turner, Susanna Biernoff, David Shuffleton, Rosemary Garland Thompson, and Alison P. Hobgood, although the academic debt list is of course much longer. I followed the legal regulations and language of the period in using disfigurement to describe deliberate or accidental changes to the face. But I do so to understand this as a form of facial difference, informed by critics such as James Partridge and Changing Faces, who advocate for people with facial difference today and critique the ways in which visible difference of any kind is often automatically considered in a negative light. Few early modern residents could expect to have entirely clear skin or all of their teeth, and many carried scars or injuries of infectious diseases like smallpox or scrofula. Yet significant facial difference was remarked upon. People covered burns and sores, and surgeons and physicians made efforts to minimise scarring. Though in Protestant thought there was an understanding of all bodies as imperfect, there was nevertheless a hierarchizing of bodily imperfections and an impetus toward medical care to balance and rectify significant aberration. Today's examples involve cutting off ears. Early modern surgeons generally did not believe that the outer ear was required for hearing, and there is no mention of this in the popular sources I've seen either. However much a sensory impairment may have resulted, especially if infection developed, Cutting off the ears was therefore understood as infliction of visible difference, not of deafness. Now, by way of content warning, this talk contains some detailed descriptions of violence. This is in the form of cutting and burning of the face on a public platform. There is a small line drawing of Jenkins having his ear cut and another of him holding it, but they are not graphic. I do not include these descriptions gratuitously. Instead, I argue that by paying closer attention to the infliction of these injuries, we can learn more about the experiences of the individuals involved, both at the time and for their later lives, and thus how these disfigurements actually affected their senses of self and relationship with communities. The sources available vary significantly, and for most people, we unfortunately lose them as soon as the law is finished with them. For others, we can tease out a little more about their experiences and how they navigated both the punishment itself and their disfigurement thereafter. On rare occasions, we can even find the voices of crip authority that Elizabeth Bearden spoke to so brilliantly in her previous talk, as people reinterpret their disfigurements as marks of identity, faith, or unjustified persecution, or merely resisted the scripts of shame and isolation that such marks were supposed to create. Jenkins, Crooks and Hayes experiences also hold significance for Britain's place in the world. Bodily health and deportment played key roles in imperial expansion, from the transportation of able vagrants to provision of medical practitioners, to the supply of body fashioning technologies that created difference between invading and indigenous populations. The demands that imperial powers placed on subjects' bodies, including pain, disability and disfigurement, were part of this dimension. This includes differences between the four nations. While Crook and Hayes probably closed judicial disfigurement in England, I have found numerous examples from the surrounding decades of men having their ears cut or pinned in Scotland and Ireland. And facial marking would continue to be used in British colonies against subordinated bodies from the branding and disfiguring of enslaved people in West Indian colonies, to the use of forehead tattoos called godna in Indian penal law, on which I would direct you to the work of Claire Anderson. It continued in the American colonies and then long beyond independence, and even into the early years of the New South Wales penal colony. Scholars of colonialism have complicated the modernizing narrative of crime and punishment by highlighting ways in which penal practices followed different paths in colonies 
and regions within them, that these subsequently affected the metropoles and, uh, and that violence towards subjugated groups and individuals was in fact integral to enlightenment practices. While the English may have railed at the treatment of Jenkins and his crew and stepped away from the use of ear cropping on London streets, they were in no way absolved from the use of these practices elsewhere. Punishments that disfigure rather than kill are designed to cause ongoing humiliation, utilizing the power of communal shaming alongside pain to permanently punish transgressors and show the inflictor's power. This is well known for the early modern period for his, from historians like Martin Ingram, Steve Hindle, J.M. Beatty, and many others. The marks were also adopted informally in fights and ambushes and in threats and actions against women in particular. The medieval disfigurement punishments examined by Patricia Skinner always worked alongside clear justifications that set out the proportionate and controlled nature of the punishment. They are still used in some areas today, officially or informally, and the interpretation of the action as a whole, as well as its specific method and effects, is subject to manipulation and interpretation. The image of proportionality and ability to control the extent of the punishment played key roles in its capacity to perform justice. Scholars like Robert Shoemaker have addressed how crowd interactions with punishments like the pillory or public execution played a key role in their use and ultimate disappearance. We can see this in action in the treatment of the Quakers, Christopher Holder and John Rouse in Boston, 1658, where their ear cropping was brought inside explicitly because of the fear of public backlash. People threw every manner of objects at pilloried people, depending on how they felt about the sentence, from flowers, rotten fruit, to rocks, to dead cats. The pillory was structured to expose the convicted person's head and a raised platform would have made the face particularly difficult to shield. It is less likely that many pilloried individuals would have carried scars of missiles thrown during their periods of exposure. Disfiguring punishments were traditionally about identification. The Elizabethan statute under which Crook and Hayes were punished explicitly noted that the marks would remain for a perpetual note or mark of the person's falsehood. The majority were designed to tell a court that you had already been convicted of a certain offence, which would dictate your sentence for a repetition. This was the purpose of benefit of clergy, which was traditionally done in the hand and dated back to the privileges of the medieval church. If you could read and thus prove you were a member of the clergy, you would be branded on the hand and released for a first felony. A late form of facial disfigurement moved the benefit of clergy brand to beside the nose between 1699 and 1706. The introduction formed, a part, formed part of a general harshening of property laws in the 1690s, but from the beginning, local authorities displayed hesitation. In repealing the act, Parliament reflected that the punishment had been too disabling. Rather than acting as a deterrent or corrective, quote, such offenders being rendered thereby unfit to be entrusted in any honest and lawful way become the more desperate. These discussions are part of the debates about natural law rights to subsistence that scholars of poverty like Jonathan Keeley have explored in relation to poor relief, which is an area more familiar to histories of disability. But J.M. Beattie highlighted complaints that malefactors were branded so faintly that the marks were worse than useless. These reasons are reconcilable if the people tasked with inflicting the burns anticipated the disabling effects of them and thus attempted to reduce the scarring or the victims bribed them to do so. Either one shows deliberate negotiation of these disabling marks. And of course, the reasons may have been many and varied across the country. <clears throat> this problem of identification would also affect people who carried innocent physical differences that could be read stigmatically. This is true of any number of physical traits. The 
nose damaged by whatever cause that reads as syphilis, for example. Mm. But in the case of legal punishments, some jurisdictions introduced mechanisms by which individuals could gain certification for their injuries. Anthony Luttrell, Carol Rawcliffe, and Irina Metzler, who has considered disfiguring punishments in light of medieval disability, have gathered a number of examples from around Western Europe. Edward Ayres shows cases recorded in Kentucky courts, and I have been tracing examples in 18th century Virginia. For example, in 1755, Margaret Campbell attended the Augusta County Court to make an oath that her eight-year-old son James's ear had been bitten off by a horse. Margaret's attendance at the court and her insistence that the cause be noted speaks volumes about the extent to which she saw both the necessity of explaining the cause of her son's disfigurement and the power of the local court as a means to do so. Other cases in the order books show men who had been injured in brawls. For example, in 1753, we see Daniel McClelland registering the loss of a piece of his left ear bit off in a fight. So although, as Elliot Gorn showed, participation in these fights was important for plebeian honour and masculinity, at least some of the men whose markings were most similar to judicial punishments felt obliged to take steps to mitigate future damage to their reputations. Now, I've not yet found any such examples in the British courts, and I'm hereby putting out an open plea uh, to anyone who has to please get in touch. Oops, sorry. Uh, now, I'm engaging less theoretically with technology in this paper than was planned when I gave my title in January. I do apologise. Uh, but the two key technology sets at work here are the medical and judiciary, judiciary tools of a pillory disfigurement, and the print news and images that circulated tales of domestic and international injuries and created meaning from them. Newspapers brought stories from across the imperial world together and listed those who were branded by law, sent to his majesty's plantations in America, or both, providing daily reminders of the capacity of the law to shape and move bodies. At the pillory, medical technology played a key role in the success and justification of judicial mutilations. A number of the ear pinning or burning punishments require repeat application and thus relied on the hangman's skill to temporarily preserve enough of the ear for the fulfillment of the sentence. Surgeons were required to stand by the pillory to staunch bleeding and so that the prisoner remained alive. These acts relied on technical skills honed in regular practice and these skills were in turn used on the, in the treatment of individuals whose faces had been marked by accident or in, incidental violence noses and ears slit in tavern fights or faces burned in falls to the fire. This technical knowledge and access to technology could also benefit an arrested practitioner, such as the physician John Bastwick, bringing his own sharp knife to his ear cutting in 1637. In the second part of this paper, I will move to the specific stories of Jenkins, Hayes and Crook. And I will begin with the most famous act of protection against a British face. The Anglo-Spanish War of 1739 to 48 has otherwise been known as the War of Jenkins' Ear since historian Thomas Carlyle used the term in 1858. Robert Jenkins, was a Welsh master mariner in charge of a ship called the Rebecca. In March 1731, the Rebecca was returning from the West Indies loaded with sugar, etc., when she was seized by a Spanish Garda Costa crew near Havana. The newspaper reports published after the Rebecca had landed in London in June attributed the Spanish embarkation to a search for illegal Spanish cargo rather than the allowed produce from the English colony in Jamaica. After finding nothing, the Spanish turned violent, tying up the Rebecca's crew and first beating and cutting Jenkins' black servant boy to compel him to disclose where any money or goods were. They then proceeded to hang and drop Jenkins and the boy several times. The other crew were beaten and restrained, 
and the Spanish emptied Jenkins' pockets and stripped the ship of clothes, bedding, candles, and navigational instruments in order to impede their return. Their commander then seized Jenkins again, and in Jenkins' own account, he took hold of his left ear and with his cutlass slit it down. And then another of the Spaniards took hold of it and tore it off, but gave him the piece of his ear again, bidding him carry it to his majesty, King George. Orders were then given for scalping him, but finding his head clothes shaved, they forbore executing that part of his sentence. There are therefore at least four stages to this disfigurement. Ear slitting, ear severing, the return of the ear to Jenkins to give to the king, and the thwarted scalping. The last is of course the most foreign to, uh, to the English press, but disappears after this account, undermined by its non-occurrence due to Jenkins' hygienic sailor's haircut. 19th century histories of the conflict would accuse Jenkins of concocting an elaborate tale to cover an insalubrious ear loss, prompting Spanish archival work from J.K. Lawton in 1889 that verified his story. And it's interesting to note that there are no such accusations at the time, at least in the public records. In London, Jenkins presented himself to the Duke of Newcastle, Secretary of State, and to Prime Minister Robert Walpole, and the story was reported to the King. Walpole did not want to go to war with Spain, and Alfred Henderson and Earle Wrighton argued that this was the key reason that he got Jenkins out of London as quickly as possible. Walpole secured Jenkins a new command in the East India Company. As would be true of so many British subjects over the next centuries, Jenkins therefore simply moved from one part of the empire to the other. He departed for Sumatra in November 1731, returned to London in June 1734, and then left again the next year. Meanwhile, local desire for a trade war against Spain had been steadily increasing. In his absence, Jenkins' story had become a rallying point for pro-imperial voices. One contributor, ostensibly from the port city of Bristol, complained that no other nation's seamen were so poorly treated and opined that the barbarous circumstances which attend this honest man's sufferings and their insolent defiance of his majesty must fill the breast of every Briton with the most lively resentment. Pro-war prints include him as an immediately recognizable figure, such as this 1738 cartoon showing a Spaniard whipping British merchants at a plough in the foreground, while Jenkins' ear is cut off on the beach in the background. In February 1739, a masquerade performance featured a richly dressed Spanish character who called himself Knight of the Ear and wore a star-shaped badge tipped with blood, an ear in the center, and just for subtlety, the word Jenkins in capital letters. When Walpole finally gave in to demands for war, a, Brit a Bristol newspaper celebrated that every citizen's breast was, quote, fired with martial ardor and an ambition of plucking off as many Spanish ears as would serve to nail on every gate throughout Great Britain. In this instance, the reprisal, reprisal blends the particular context with the traditional practices of the country, where domestic ears had indeed been pinned to public structures. Some sailors in the war would have had a daily visual reminder of Jenkins' experience. In 1742, the swift shore ship was rebuilt and relaunched as the Revenge. Newspapers reported that her carved decorations included Captain Jenkins with his ear cut off in the hands of the Spaniard. The ship would remain in service until 1787 with no rebuild in the meantime. So that carved depiction of Jenkins' disfigurement would have accompanied crews to several fields of war over the next 45 years. In March, 1738, Jenkins was twice summoned to the House of Commons to retell his story. His appearance was satirically recorded by Samuel Johnson in the Gentleman's Magazine and in cartoons like this one. Here we see Walpole sitting at a table covered in reminders of British embarrassments at Spanish hands. A petitioning merchant is being shown the door, the dog chews a, pap a paper labelled the merchant's complaint, 
a Spanish ship fires on an English one, and most importantly for us, Robert Jenkins is centre stage, holding out his severed ear to the reluctant Prime Minister. Not only is Jenkins holding his ear, but a black servant is removing Jenkins' wig to emphasise the visual absence of the ear from his head. Perhaps this is supposed to be the same young man who had been with Jenkins on Rebecca, showing more faith to Jenkins than Walpole is. I don't know. Jenkins' appearance at the House of Commons, presenting his severed ear to the Parliament to spur them into action, speaks to the emotive potential of the disfigurement and the re-performance of pain demanded of him. But, and it's a big but, it probably never happened. Jenkins was not among the merchants petitioning for action against Spain. He had been taken care of with his new posting and was thereafter rarely in London. The fact he had to be summoned twice shows he wasn't hanging around at the time. Newspapers and the Journal of the House of Commons never record his attendance. And in fact, Henderson found evidence to suggest that Jenkins only returned from a second voyage to India in May 1738 meaning that he was away when the hearing had supposedly occurred. Ultimately, as historians of the conflict from Harold Templey and Philip Woodfine onwards have long noted, the Anglo-Spanish conflict was not really a war about Jenkins' ear. It was a war about political, diplomatic, and especially commercial rivalry among the two colonizing powers. This was also far from the only report of violence. In 1740, to give just one example, another master from a captured English ship wrote that the crew had been treated with great cruelties, including cutting off noses and arms in cold blood and wantonness. But as I will show in a moment, the use of Jenkins' ear cutting as a spur to war was also curtailed by the ears cut on London's own streets. And the timing of Jenkins' return was an especially stones and glass houses moment the government. I'm going to leave the war itself to other scholars and return insofar as I can to Robert Jenkins. How did life with a visible difference affect Jenkins thereafter? How did London residents react to him in the streets? Were there private suspicions about the true cause of his ear loss? In, Ju in July 1738, he left London again, bound for Bombay and China. On board, his story would have been well known, and even in the wider naval circles, he was probably close enough to a celebrity for very few to have mistaken his ear for the result of a pillory or brawl. Any misinterpretations would have been short-lived, and besides, seafaring was a particularly dangerous field, resulting in highly variable bodies. Perhaps a more interesting area for research will be the receptions Jenkins received among the different port communities and cultures he encountered. But this is something I have not even been able to begin to delve into yet. This is in part because published historical accounts point Jenkins' career in two directions. In one version, the East India Company appoints Jenkins to investigate a monetary scandal among the administrators of St. Helena and then to take over as governor in 1741, where he dies the next year. In the other, he apparently remains, or at least returns to sea and dies of a fever in Bombay, either in December 1742 or 43. I await the ability to visit the National Archives and British Library to try and find out more. And especially if his correspondence from the St. Helena posting can shed light on his reception and experiences on the island. For the time being, Jenkins' personal experience of disability is wrapped in mystery. I must therefore turn to a man whose story complicated the public impact of Jenkins' facial difference. When Jenkins arrived on June 10, London was anticipating another disfigurement. This would probably be the last official facial disfigurement carried out in London. I say probably because, of course, you never know what might turn up in the archive or what someone here might contribute in the Q&A. But for the time being, this is the latest example that I know of, 
and I suspect is still a later date than most people would expect. In October 1728, Jaffet Crook, alias Sir Peter Stranger, was indicted for forging deeds to an estate in Essex. Using these fake deeds, Crook mortgaged the property for around four and a half thousand pounds. The offence thus crossed both property and forgery, which were areas of the law attracting strident punishments in general, but when combined led the court to a forgery statute enacted in 1562 by Elizabeth I. Under this statute, Crook was liable to be put in the pillory, have both nostrils slit and both ears cut off before suffering perpetual imprisonment. He was found guilty in February, but with the help of his attorney, John Booth, launched a long series of appeals to escape this specific statute, even if he would be convicted under another. In other words, for the next three years, Crook made a series of appearances attempting to save his ears and instead secure merely imprisonment or transportation. When Crook was eventually sentenced under the statute in 1731, Newspapers were split in their opinion of the punishment. Some emphasised the temporal distancing of this very old statute, while others found reasoning in more recent precedents. A key one is the punishment of Charles Young in 1719 in Bayminster, Dorset, which is described as receiving a parallel sentence. I know that the course in case involved another forged will, but unfortunately, without some travel, don't yet know the extent of Young's disfigurement or his life thereafter. So for now, it's just notable that newspapers supportive of the sentence use this recent English case to help explain Crook's fate. Others, however, argued against the use of such extensive disfigurement. The Daily Advertiser reports great intercession being made for a reduction, but we hear it meets with as great opposition. The punishment was actually delayed another week in order to miss a Saint's Day holiday. So on Friday, the 10th of June, 1731, as Robert Jenkins may land at Gravesend, a large crowd gathered at the pillory at Charing Cross to wait for Jaffet Crook. A Dutch news book reporting on the punishment said that such a large crowd had never been seen at the cross, but otherwise I have no evidence yet for how Crook was received by the audience after he arrived at midday. After an hour, Crook was set in a chair and the public hangman, dressed like a butcher, quote, with a sort of pruning knife, cut off both his ears. And when that was done, a surgeon clapped a stick styptic thereon. Then the executioner with a pair of scissors cut his left nostril twice before it was quite through, and then at once cut through his right nostril. The account notes that Crook bore these cuts with great patience, but at the searing his right nostril with a hot iron, he was in such pain and agony that his left nostril was not seared and he was carried off the pillory bleeding. A styptic is a medicine to stop bleeding and the searing with an iron is also a cauterizing action, here interrupted. Crook was carried to, a nearby ship, to the nearby ship tavern where he stayed for about two hours before he was returned to the King's Bench prison. At the tavern, his wounds were further dressed by the surgeon, and perhaps he was also visited by his friends and supporters. The postboy gives additional details of his conduct at the pillory. According to them, Crook underwent the sentence with a great deal of courage and resolution, never so much as winched or flinched, but put on his cap and tucked up his hair under it himself, thus giving the hangman better access to his ears. His prosecutors were at Mr. Harvey's at a stiller's at Charing Cross, to whom he turned and laughed and made a motion with his hand. I don't know what the motion would be. But thus we see evident emphasis on Crook's bravado. The Daily Journal newspaper was very brief in its account of the punishment for the simple reason that it also advertised a fuller account on sale next week. This shilling pamphlet is an effusive narration on the insufficiency of the sentence. They wanted death, and the accuracy of the biography is, of course, debatable. But there are some useful details, such as a birth date of 1662, which at least gives Crook the general appearance of a man in his 60s or 70s. 
Among the claims are that he first assumed the guise of Sir Peter Stranger in Cork and through his, through his arrest trapped an attorney named Hooker into a perjury that resulted in Hooker also losing an ear in the pillory. There is polygamy and the dispatching of an irate wife number two and a child to New England before taking a fourth in Scotland. If anyone was expecting more details of his sentence, they would be sorely disappointed as the volume instead focuses on his fraudulent business dealings and a number of letters on these topics. If Crook was all over the newspapers of June 11, his story would not hold attention for too long. From the 12th, we see him starting to share newspaper columns with Robert Jenkins and Rebecca, such as this page from the Daily Journal. We see the report that the Spanish Garda Costa put her people to a torture in order to extort a confession of, uh, of illegal trade, which is accurate for the level of detail that was publicly available on this day. And then we hear that the ears of Jaffet Crook are in the possession of Mr. Rollo at the Tippling Philosopher's Tavern in Fourth Street near Cripplegate, and that great numbers of people were there yesterday to see them. Now it's standard form in these papers to report news with we hear, but it seems particularly jarring in this case. This is the only hint I have for the fate of Crook's ears, it, sorry, Crook's ears, it might be completely made up, uh, but it speaks to the appetites of the public for gruesome me mementos of the pillory. Four Street is a good two miles from Charing Cross, so Mr. Rollo or his vendor would have had a disarming walk through the streets with the ears in their pockets. Several other papers reported on the same day that Crook was, unsurprisingly, very ill of the wounds. On the 15th, he is again reported dangerously ill, his head being swollen in great degree and being attended with a fever that they had little hopes of his recovery. What is remarkable about, remarkable about this second news column from the Daily Current is that it follows this mention of Crook's illness and sentence with a more euphemistic reference to Jenkins' barbarous usage from the Spaniards. The full story had now come out, so it seems a deliberate move not to place these two men's ears side by side. By the 18th, after several days of Jenkins' story, Cook was reported in good health with no mention of his ears whatsoever. Here we can note the emphasis on preservation of life that was required to help justify disfiguring punishments as alternatives, not equivalents to a death sentence. Alexander Pope later snidely observed that Crook's money was ample reward for the small loss of his ears. And this note may have increased the notoriety of Crook's case. Crook died in prison in 1734, and the next half decade saw several disputes about his not insignificant estate. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Essex property was not the only potential forgery or deception that complicated his finances. But apart from mention of him as the famous Jaffet Crook, there is minimal note of his punishment in these discussions. There is, in other words, a gap as people po focused on the treatment of the likes of Jenkins before Crook's punishment later passed into a tale about the bad old days of judicial disfigurement. Newspaper reports would be copied and extracted for historical color and as a reminder to those transported for life for similar offenses of forgery, their punishment could have been much worse. With Jenkins overseas and Crook dying in jail, I would like to end with another merchant seaman, the Yorkshire-born Captain Thomas Hayes, who offers a glimpse at the experience of living with visible difference in London in the same period. In February 1728, Hayes was convicted of forging a bond. He was sentenced under the same Elizabethan statute as Crook a year later. Only in this less valuable case, he was only to lose one year at the Charing Cross pillory. One newspaper at the time, perhaps thinking it unlikely to really occur, saw humour in his punishment, posting a notice that a gentleman had purchased the ear, the ear in advance. Quote, the ear is intended to be preserved in spirits of wine and either made a present of to the knickknackatory in Oxford, to the death part of the law, or to the ingenious gentleman of the Royal Society, 
or otherwise the owner will, in his own custody, expose it gratis, it's free, to the view of the curious who shall desire to peruse it. The Nicknackatory is the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, and here we have digs at that collection, the law that is metaphorically deaf to justice, and the Royal Society scientists who might treat the affair as a purely academic exercise. The process on the day was very similar to that which Crook would receive two years later. On March 26, 1729, Hayes stood on the pillory for an hour before being seated in a chair. According to the only direct report I have, it was a surgeon who cut off his left ear, so presumably with a knife. The surgeon then delivered the ear into Hayes' own hand, but an officer then took it from him and held it to the view of the crowd and afterwards folded it up in a paper and put it in his pocket. This is a frustratingly ambiguous sentence. Did the officer put the wrapped ear in Hayes' pocket or did he keep it for himself? perhaps recognizing the kind of interest that is indicated by the notice of sale. Hayes was then taken to the Marshalsea prison. prison. Again, like Crook and cases before them, we are updated on Hayes' health in the days following. On Friday, the Daily Post informed readers that Hayes had been ill the day before, but had been attended by a physician, thus ensuring that a sentence of disfigurement would not result in death. The other significant difference in this case was that Hayes was only to be imprisoned for four years. So he was released on March, uh, around March 1733. And because his story was remembered, or Crook and Jenkins had kept ears in the news, or even that Hayes was himself just well known, we are lucky to have reports of his death on the 22nd of June 1736. Now, I say lucky because they do allow me to fill in some of the personal details of Hayes' experience at the pillory and once he had re-entered the community with a disfigurement intended to serve as a permanent mark of his crime, a disabling signifier of untrustworthiness and a wedge between him and the honest people of the town. And it does not appear to have done so. After leaving prison, Hayes returned to the, to the same lodgings at the Bolt and Tun Inn in Fleet Street that he had apparently lived in since 1690. He had also accrued a healthy fortune as commander and owner of several ships, which had not been seized by the law. While it might be supposed that the injury and time in prison had weakened his health, leading to death within four years, he was actually an elderly man. The newspapers say 91, even if we had to take that with a grain of salt, uh, it is at least suggestive of a very old age. And this would also have made him a very old man on the pillory and perhaps further contributed to the surgeon and physician who attended him um, at and after the ear cutting. So Hayes returned to the same community and there is a key point to suggest that he did so without any attempt to hide his disfigurement. Not only is he described as still a tall, lusty man, but the newspaper reports that he wore his own gray hair. That is, he did not take the easier route for a man of means of wearing a wig that would cover his missing ear. The paper's mention of this one detail shows that the author themselves recognized Hay's choice, whether they thought it a praiseworthy option or not. On July 1, Hayes was buried in a decent private manner in the churchyard of St Dunstan and All Saints in Stepney, the so-called Church of the High Seas, where his father, brother, and several other relations of this maritime family already lay. Having had his ear cut before Jenkins, Hayes died as the country was still deciding whether to enter a war that would bear the latter's name. He had spent the final few years of his life in the shifting merchant seaman community of London, wearing his own hair that exposed his ear and no doubt swapping stories with his merchant peers about the latest Spanish deprivations. The extent to which Hayes or even Crook might have paralleled their own experiences of ear cutting with Jenkins is irrecoverable, but perhaps even they brought the distinction made through the apparatuses of justice to justify their punishment. 
The medical care that was provided at the pillory ensured that punishment was limited to the prescribed amount. Crook was given three years of appeals to escape his sentence under the statute, and precedents of recent English and English colonial croppings could easily be found, though this was to be a short-lived point. As I have said, Crook's is the last case that I have found so far in England, and it may have played an unacknowledged role in the complicated reception of John Robert Jenkins that has been lost to the colour of the War of Jenkins' Ear. Together, they also contributed to the removal of ear cropping from England and the rhetorical displacement of it as a cruel practice of other times and places. Rhetorical because they would continue in many parts of the empire, making the state's punishment and protection of the face something that would continue to affect the experiences of people with facial difference. Thank you.